So um, welcome everyone to today's many handed event. Uh, Valerie McGuire is presenting her book. So that's very exciting. And you know that because you saw the title and that's why you're here. So the event is hosted by the Institute of European Studies at UC Berkeley. Um, it's actually within that is something called the Program for the Study of Italy. So that's who invited her. And then the IES is, is our larger container. So um, we're very pleased, the IES is pleased, the Program for the Study of Italy is pleased because we have a singularly high number of visitors for this talk. So we're extra pleased with that. So I'll explain the format quickly because uh, we don't have much time. We'll be done at one o'clock. Um, so I'm going to say just a few introductory words about the field with the, or at least some of the fields within which Valerie's book intervenes. And then Valerie will present, she has a few images um, and she's going to speak in some broad strokes about the project. This has been a long project and it has a lot of different kinds of materials, so she'll have to simplify to some degree. And then very excitingly, as a respondent discussant, we have Professor Christine Filiou from the History Department at the University of California at Berkeley. So I have worked on Italian colonialism for a long time and that's one vantage point on this work, but Christine's work is as an Ottomanist and therefore in the same region, but typically with other kinds of materials. So this is a really exciting kind of sandwich uh, <laughs> of, of how to think about this project. So um, uh, let me just say my few introductory things. So many of you know this, I'm sorry for those for whom this is a repetition, but the study of Italian colonialism in the modern sort of post-unification era including the fascist era, but it began long before actually, um, has its own difficulties as a field. It is, I always hasten to say Italian colonialism was not just like French colonialism and it was not just like British colonialism, which is where some of the things that sort of colored the scholarship as it was when I started working on it as a grad student. So I'm still quite attached to defining Italian empire, entire Italian colonialisms in their own right, even though the Italians themselves tended, and I'm sure Valerie will mention this, tended to define their colonial projects themselves in relation to and in contrast with what the French had done or were doing and what the British had done or were doing. So we have this difficulty in finding a little nook for how Italy went about having colonies. The place that Valerie has worked on and in, Rhodes or the Dodecanese Islands, were uh, technically speaking a possession of Italy starting in 1912 by treaty. Um, however, uh, in essence, the Italian state treated the Dodecanese Islands as a colony. In my own work, I just say, well, it's a colony, even though legally speaking, it had a slightly different status. But there are other ways in which Rhodes and the islands overall, um, I don't know if enjoyed is the right word, but there was a certain ambiguity throughout in the status from the Italian vantage point, which is of course the one I know particularly well. Um, so Italy was already in Eritrea since, well, before 1890, and then uh, its last colonial ventures would be in Ethiopia starting in 1935 and Albania in 1939. But Libya happened at just about the same time as the Dodecanese Islands and all of those territories were in fact seized from, with whatever level of difficulty, the Ottoman Empire. And that is the commonality there. So um, that's just to give a little bit of context. The reason I said ambiguous is because the Italians even before, but also during fascism, perceived the Greeks as almost European, almost, can make, you could almost make them into Italians. Um, they were Christian, they were the wrong kind of Christian. So the, there's a kind of oddity there that has in fact colored the life of the Dodecanese after Italian colonialism as well. That has legacies that I'm particularly interested in in my work. But 
Um, there's also the issue of citizenship per se. So this is something scholars have not completed the sorting out of at all, uh, how citizenship was dealt with in the official Italian colonies in North and East Africa, but this is also the case for, I see Dominique Ryle here, so I'll just say in the Adriatic area, uh, <laughs> right? Just so, so citizenship is a, is a almost impossible issue for post-unification Italy up until after World War II. And so Valerie's work intervenes in that discussion I don't need to explain to anybody on this call that this is pertinent to current issues of migration, um, disasters of shipwrecks and passports and so on and so forth. So, but now I'm gonna stop talking and hand the floor, so to speak, over to Valerie. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mia. And thank you to the Institute of European Studies for um, welcoming me and giving me this opportunity to talk about my book, which has been a very, very long time in coming. So I'm really happy to have seen it to completion. Um, and one of the challenges, of course, of the, the material is obviously this transnational nature. So working on Italy while also working on Greece and the and an uh, area of the Ottoman Empire. So one of the issues I kind of wanted to think about um, in this event was what are these challenges and how do researchers cope with them um, and move and apply, go move beyond the field of kind of their area studies. Um, and then also what are some of the stakes of reintegrating the Dodecanese into the history of Italian colonial empire. So um, just to give a kind of brief um, look at what I'm going to try and share today, I'm going to pull up, um, I think, uh, share screen. I'm having a little bit of, hmm. give me a second. So uh, while I do that, I think I have some sort of weird setting on my computer. So what I wanna say, first of all, is where are the Dodecanese islands? If you're unfamiliar with them, um, they sit um, right between uh, Turkey and um, Europe. They're on very much on Europe's most southeastern per periphery. So they're at the border of modern day Greece and modern day Turkey. And better known places are Cyprus and Crete. Um, we can say, so when I started this project, as Mia said, I was part of, um, this kind of new discovery of Italian colonial empire or rediscovery, which has been going on for a very long time, but there's still so much resistance to thinking about Italy as having had um, a significant colonial empire. It's obviously kind of considered much less than the ones in France and Britain. And unlike Libya and East Africa, which have been areas that have been widely um, investigated the Dodecanese are kind of left outside of this history. There's no sort of Angelo Del Boca or Richard Painhurst, if you're familiar with the fields of the Dodecanese. And so I'm not saying that there wasn't any research um, available when I began this project, but those that the different researchers that were was available was a bunch of different shreds and pieces coming at it from different angles. So on the one hand, there was a major study by um, Nicholas Dumanis. And he's, but this was kind of a, in many ways a diasporic perspective since Dumanis is a descendant of the Dodecanese diaspora in Australia. And some of the research was kind of what you might call top down and it was focused on how the Dodecanese played into Italy's wider foreign policy during the, um, the during fascism and the second world war. And then there were a few kind of Greek language historiographies. And, but these, most of these kind of cleave to the notion of Italocratia or Italian occupation. And they really brought into the idea that it was part of Greece's World War II history. Though if you know, if you have any knowledge of Greek, you also know that this phrase Italocratia strongly reprises the Turcocratia or the Ottoman um, occupation domination of four centuries of, of imperial rule in Greece. So um, 
And alongside a lot of these different pieces of research, there was also what Edward Said would call meta ge geographies to, to reckon with. So a bunch of different labels where we could situate the Dodecanese. So the islands could be considered part of the Balkans. Um, at the turn of the century, they are in a territory of the Ottoman Empire that still seems to be inside Europe as Mia was alluding to before. But on the other hand, the islands are so close to Turkey that they're also viewed as potentially part of the Orient. And interestingly, indeed, when Italy is able to initially occupy the islands in 1912, because their Triple Alliance partners at the time, Austria, Hungary, and Germany, agree that the Dodecanese are so far to the east that they can be considered part of Asia and not Europe. So not necessarily part of the Balkans. And so they allow Italy to occupy the islands to relinquish Libya. Uh, so thirdly, the islands are linked then to this idea of the Eastern Mediterranean um, or what was known in that time as the Near East or Levant. And that kind of conjures up these associations of a cosmopolitan multicultural world, not that's not governed yet kind of by the regime of the nation state. You don't have sort of these proliferation of homogenous genius uh, nation states and you still have this pluralistic system that involves Greeks, Turks and Jews as well as European elites. Um, so that's strongly associated with the 19th century and cities like Alexandria or Izmir. Um, and finally, when you come, then you add in this further, further layer of coming at it from the perspective of Italian colonialism. And here, of course, Italian colonialism has many links to the idea of Mare Nostrum, right? Of Roman, the reconquest of Roman Empire under Mussolini's uh, fascist state. And so um, that is, it strongly evokes the idea of the, of the Mediterranean. And that's an, an idea which is maybe not fully theorized. And so my point is of all of this is to say is that as I tried to work through different meta geographies and decide which space I was working on, was I working on a Greek or an Ottoman, Middle Eastern, Mediterranean, Italian colonial space? It became more and more clear to me that what I was going to have to work on was the kind of very issue of meta geographies um, and how these are imperial, but also reinterpreted and revisited by colonized people. So it's not just a label that's applied from the imperial state, but also one that then has an afterlife in its reappropriation. So I, kind of within this kind of story, I can also tell another one about how this went from being um, a piece of research right, written as a dissertation for my discipline in Italian studies, and then became something which tried to open itself out to a larger debate about kind of colonialism and post-colonial critique in European imperial studies. So when I wrote it as a dissertation, my main research question was one that was, well, what does studying Italy's imperial project in the Aegean tell us about Italian colonialism in Africa? Um, so with this framing, I was already able to make some suggestions that are what in many ways a departure from how the Dodecanese had been understood. And, and this is what Mia was talking about a few minutes ago. So by thinking about the Dodecanese in relation to African colonialism, I've already made the claim, which is essentially something that's stating the obvious, that the Dodecanese were one of Italy's colonies. And this might seem sort of not very interesting, but the longer that I do this, the more I think this is a really important point. Um, and the reason that the Dodecanese hadn't been included in Italy's colonial hist history, it was entirely tautological, meaning that the Dodecanese were placed under the Ministry of Foreign Affairs rather than the Ministry of Colonies. It was their categories. Um, but in the, in the book then, as I develop the project, I'm more able to think about this and to show how Italian rule in the Aegean was closely linked to colonialism in Libya, but also other parts of the, the Mediterranean where there were Italian diasporic communities. So places such as Tunisia and Egypt and how this whole project was in dialogue with these other spaces of kind of pseudo colonialism, places that could become, that were imperial experiences, even if not called colonies as such. So it really kind of opens up kind of how we think about empire. Um, 
And of course, then another thing, and I'm sorry, because I don't know what's wrong with the, I have funny settings on my computer here, so I can't do my slides. But um, I also thought about how um, some of what some of the projects were in the Dodecanese look very similar to types of projects that were happening in the fa in fascist Italy at the in the peninsula at the same time. So to give, um, you know, and I'm not the only researcher to think about this, of course, but to give an example how it was similar to what Italy was doing in its borderlands in the Trentino Alto Adige or in the Agro Pontino, the area between um, Campania and Rome, where the, you know, Mussolini had this project to kind of recreate a rural space, return to tradition, drain the swamps, um, the Bonifica, which is so famous. Um, and so in many ways, uh, the Dodecanese kind of, in a way, they prove something which we already know to be true, um, which is the empire and nation especially in this time period, they were two sides of the same ideological coin. Um, and a lot of scholars, of course, have been saying this for a long time, that there's many links between a, the concept of uh, the nation state and the project of empire in Europe. And of course, in fascist Italy in particular, this relationship between the colonies as laboratories for modernity and then that relationship to an increasingly racist um, regime at home is well known. So I think what made this interesting is that why then have the Dodecanese been left out of this discussion? Um, why is it that they had kind of this status as special, as sui generis, um, that they were unlike Italy, unlike Africa, rather than the opposite, which was like what happened in Italy and like what happened in Africa. So this was one of the ways in which I, I started to open it up. And I, I think I should add here too that um, when I started the project, the Dodecanese was strongly linked to what we call myths of Italiani brava gente, the idea of Italians as good people. Um, and the islands, of course, are highly evocative of this idea of, you know, Italians love, preferred to make love, not war. They played the mandolin, et cetera, all kinds of stereotypes of the Mediterranean. That kind of, that are also linked to this idea of una faccia or una razza, one face, one race, and Italians and Greeks as part of uh, some kind of Mediterranean brotherhood. So we have all kinds of stereotypes and no real rich understanding of what the project actually looked like. Um, and so what I really started to think about coming away from this project is how the absence of the Dodecanese, in fact, speaks to kind of a lot of entrenchment in categories of the ways that we do think about Italian um, culture and part of, and how kind of the notions of Mediterranean as a meta geography might still be influencing the ways in which Italy perceives its own colonial past. So just to be more clear about that, the reason that the Italian state viewed the islands as not one of their African colonies is also that it was not black, right? Um, that it was, uh, that it was, that these are hierarchies of race, which push back, which are, you know, embedded in these categories. And by not looking at them, we're kind of perpetuating them. And it's at the same time, there was a lot of push pushback over any suggestion that the islands could be kind of a province or a provincial extension of Italy, as the population was far too Levantine. So, in many ways, the failure to include the Dodecanese as part of the path, colonial past marks the way in which there's still resistance to thinking about Italy as having had an imperial state. And I think somewhat ironically, um, Italy has been able to acknowledge its relationship to empire in the kind of in the guise of the questione meridionale and in the southern question. And in the idea that they can, they can accept the idea that the unification of Italy was an imperial project of the North over the South, but that strangely the insights of, of Antonio Gramsci, which have been really useful for subaltern studies and, and have kind of founded this whole field of post-colonialism, haven't really been put applied to the same degree to Italy's own colonial past. So um, that kind of brings me to what I think is kind of another intervention of my book, which is what is the status of the Mediterranean in Italian culture and in the direction of the field of Italian um, colonial and post-colonial studies. So in the past 20 years, there's been so much new and really great research coming out of the field. Um, and also in relation to the idea of post-colonial identities and the migration crisis in the Mediterranean. 
And during this time, there is emerging both scholarship and the arts, the idea of a, a Mediterranean alternative, espousing a position of Mediterraneata or Mediterraneanness as kind of an ideological counterpoint to either far-right nationalism or projects to deter illegal migration in the Mediterranean through carceral processes, what's kind of known as by Fortress Europe. Um, but it's what's interesting is this whole notion of Mediterraneata or Mediterraneous really owes its origins as a, as a counter notion to Italianita or Italianness and the asp that aspiration to become a kind of homogeneous Italian nation state. And it of course is, has its genealogy back in the idea of Meridionalismo and Southern thought. And what I think is so important is what's kind of elided in these discussions is how Mediterraneata also was part of Italy's imperial moment and can be clearly understood also as an important imperial formation. So, and here again, I, just to kind of give us a counterpoint to how this might look if you come at, if you're thinking about French empire as opposed to Italian empire, in, in French empire, it's, it's taken for granted that Mediterranean or Mediterraneanness in the French version is, is off clearly linked to, to French empire in North Africa. And so there's been all of these important discussions about how, for example, Brodel, the author of you know, the original person to kind of think of the concept of the Mediterranean was a French historian working on the eve of decolonization and, and longing for empire. Um, and to what degree then is Mediterraneata also speaking about, I don't say that it's uh, nostalgic, but to what degree it's speaking about uh, Italy's colonial, own colonial, colonial past. So one of the things that I kind of trace out in the book then is that how important the Mediterranean actually was for some of Italy's early kind of biopolitical ideas about race. So I look in particular at the writings of Giuseppe Sergi, who was writing precisely against the grain of, of the idea that there were two races in Italy, one an Aryan one in the north and a um, African one in the south, right? And he puts forward the idea of an ancient Mediterranean stirpe. Uh, the subtleties are slightly different. It's not exactly race, but stock. And, and, but, in this suggestion, which is kind of, you know, it's been kind of eclipsed by this north-south thing in, in Italian culture, is he also suggests that there was this uh, primordial cousinhood relationship between Greeks and Italians, right? Um, so according to Sergi, Greeks and Italians were in ancient times, part of the same face and same race. Um, but uh, there was also, this also means that there was a fundamental biological difference between the Mediterranean and the Semitic races, right? And, and this is Semitic in both the sense of Jews and Arabs. And so what I kind of ultimately trace out when I look at some of the citizenship question is how to a certain degree this position of a Mediterranean based race versus a Semitic one is, is kind of borne out in how Italy actually adopts and um, policies and official anti-Semitic policy, which is in alignment with Hitler following the invasion of Ethiopia, but in the Dodecanese kind of consists also of reprisals against both the Jewish and Turkish minorities. And in the meantime, greater efforts to Italianize the Greek part of the local population. So um, I think this, I will kind of, bring this to what can probably be my kind of concluding point, because I, I want to leave open some time for Q&A, um, which is that kind of then introducing all of these questions um, still raises also some big questions about what does this tell us about modern Greece and Ottoman transitions. Um, and here again, I think we hit another lacuna. If if the Dodecanese have been absent from Italian colonial inquiry for the reasons of sort of not being inside the current paradigms, you have in modern Greece, you have nation state, nation centered frames rather than kind of looking at transitions and transnationalism, which have always dominated the field of Greek history. And so I think we can start to understand that you know, Greek historians are not going to be eager necessarily to evaluate the Dodecanese um, because they don't want to necessarily think about 
the Ottoman state. And this is where, again, um, this is something which scholars like Molly Green have thought about, that there's this whole resistance to thinking about the Ottoman past in, in modern Greece's history. So it's a, another kind of Mediterranean problem, which mirrors the Italian one. But this, there's kind of this interesting kind of, kind of historical collision, let's call it, because Italy ends up with the islands after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire during um, World War I. And so because of this, the Dodecanese actually stay out of one of the major events of modern Greek and Turkish history, which is the exchange of minority populations in the Aegean, which was organized by the British Empire. So it's the first one, but places like India and Pakistan will follow. And what this means is that in the interwar period, the islands stay in this kind of complicated situation, which is reminiscent of the Ottoman state. And the population is organized according to religious conf confession with large Turkish and Jewish minority populations in some of the islands. Um, and it, this is of course a great source of exoticism and fascination for the Italian state. They have a lot to work with. And if you're familiar, of course, um, this is kind of some of the images I wanted to show on my slides. But if you're familiar with a figure like Marinetti, right, who was born in Egypt and, and claimed to be an African man and to embrace barbarism and the primitive and the oriental, you already know that there's this strong desire in Italian culture to kind of associate with these orientalist exoticisms. And so the Dodecanese provides a kind of perfect palimpsest for, for kind of thinking about and, and growing that side of it. Um, but but it still raises the question is what did this kind of what did this mean for the pro, the for the pop, local population um and i was asking this question not only because i was interested in kind of disrupting these myths of, of italiani brava gente but also because i think it's an important question that any kind of study that's really grounded in a post-colonial critique should be asking what was the what were the stakes of it for the for the local population and so just to return to some of the citizenship questions, what I, kind, what I discovered is that there were actually a lot of good incentives for the local population to embrace the idea of Mediterraneanita or imperial Mediterraneanness, right? They had, it stood for, for benefits for them too. So in retracing citizenship, the citizenship is developed ostensibly to kind of secure sovereignty in the islands, but it's also one that enables locals, just like their Italian colonizers, to emigrate and repatriate with ease. Um, and if you're familiar with Mark Choate's book, Emigrant Nation, which I think by now everyone, everyone in the field has read, um, <laughs> then you'll know that, um, that you'll be familiar with this idea that citizenship is obviously one of Italy's imperial instruments. Um, and that emigration could help it create, to create a worldwide ethnographic empire of Italian culture and identity. But I think that this kind of grows in the context of the Dodecanese and it's also a Mediterranean ethnographic empire. And, and so I think there's gonna be, it's logical that in Greece, there's not gonna be a whole lot of enthusiasm for, for thinking about how the fascist state may have been appealing to the local community. Um, and, but I think there's a lot of ways in which this can be interesting. And I, I think it's also like someone thinking about how citizenship has this kind of gets reused by people in these, in these imperial regimes is a really important question. Um, and I think that there was a lot of incentives, for example, just to name one, this was a time when there were bans on migrants from Southeastern Europe in the US. So how does the status, how does having Italian citizenship kind of in a world that's closing its borders, Italy, which wants to expand its borders in an imperial way, it offers something to, to the local population. And I think that we have to think about then the Mediterranean um, as an, in the afterlife of this, if we're talking about the Mediterranean, Mediterranean is an imperial form, uh, formation. What what kinds of what are the motives for kind of keeping that alive locally in the local discourse? And I think that you know it also clearly insulates the Dodecanese against 
many, many tensions between Greeks and Turks, which are very lively still to this day. And it also insulates against the fact that the Jewish communities of the Aegean are left with a question mark as to what's gonna happen to them after the co collapse of the Ottoman Empire. So interestingly, this expression, una faccia una razza, um, which seem, seems to refer to the program of recuperating a Greco-Roman empire in the Mediterranean, and even these ideas of race as Italian, Greeks and Italians as cousins, in its reappropriation refers to the idea that the different communities of the Aegean, Greeks, Turks, and Jews kind of got along and, and you know, it has another kind of fabled status. Um, but I can say more about this issue of Ottoman transitions and Mediterraneanita and, and the Aegean in the Q and A. All right, so uh, Christine, it's your turn. You're still muted for yes, this. Okay. <laughs> I wondered why no one could hear me. There you go. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I really enjoyed the book. Um, I guess like the Greeks in Valerie's study, I have a kind of a blurry relationship to this material. Um, it's both familiar and very foreign to me. And that's one reason why I found the book so interesting to think with, not just about Ottoman history, but about modern Greek and modern Turkish history, and obviously the transition to those. Um, for me, it, it's really a fresh look at a geography that I thought I knew pretty well after <laughs> a few decades of studying it. Um, and not because I'm reluctant to look at Greece's Ottoman past, um, but because of this peculiar, um, presence, it, this peculiar Italian presence in and relationship to the Eastern Mediterranean, which like the Italians are just kind of always there. <laughs> it's this, it's a funny, I don't, I could describe it like maybe as ethereal or um, kind of um, subtle, but ever present. It's often kind of comical um, in my experience because um, I had studied Samos quite a bit um, earlier on when I was writing my dissertation and there's like all this lore. Samos was an autonomous polity in the 19th century until 1912. And I think it was the late 19th or early 20th century. Um, there was a, a, road, a project to build one contiguous road all around the island. And it was um, apparently an Italian engineer that came and did it. And he charged by the like meter or by the kilometer or something. So the road is like deliberately very circuitous around the island. And so there's this like, it's just this funny legacy of an Italian presence, not the state presence that you're talking about, but it's like, there's always just something kind of comical about it when, they, when they're when they involved and a little bit hapless maybe. I'm sorry to like play on stereotypes, but I also, you know, just to give you an example, I encountered um, when I was doing my undergraduate thesis, I stumbled onto this. And again, it was just this kind of lingering question mark for me all these years. But I wrote my undergraduate thesis about um, fur, fur manufacturing workers in New York in the interwar period um, who were Greek Ottomans, Ottoman Greeks. Um, and they were an important minority in a largely Russian Jewish industry. And this was all fine. They had their own little separate Greek local and nobody bothered them until the, was it the 1965 Civil Rights Act? And then they, um, there had to be a trial about whether they could continue to have a separate Greek local or not. And so um, I actually dug up my thesis because it's such a, and, and it, they questioned this one of the leaders of the Greek local who happened to be from the Dodecanese. This is in 1965 and they're questioning him and they say, Mr. Demelis, where were you born? And he says, in Dodecanese Island, small island. It's in Greece right now. Question, what was your nationality when you came to this country in 1920? Really, I don't know, I tell you the truth. Who issued your passport? Answer, must be Turkey because that time it was Italy, but I understand Italy was not a nation that he had the island. It was only there by League of Nations in order to keep the island for the League of Nations. So therefore must be Turkish passport. Um, <laughs> so this also, it's this like lingering question of like, well, what, <laughs> what happened? Was it Italian? Why were the Italians there? So this, I found this book super illuminating because it was like this 
oh, there is a whole history there. It is, there are good reasons why it hasn't been written about um, sort of systematically before because it does seem to occupy this blurry space, right? Of connection, domination. It's like this arresting sameness. <laughs> um, it's the extension of really what was an age old um, synthesis, the Greco-Roman, Greco-Italian, which honestly never went away. Um, and so I wasn't so surprised by the modern construction of this medieval relationship because through, I mean, as we know from Konstantina Zanu's um, recent book, like even in the, throughout the 19th century on both sides of the national divide, Greeks and Italians were having a very hard time untangling that relationship and creating a separateness out of it. So for me, as someone who's spent my life studying this Greek-Turkish interface, where it's always surprising to find sameness because we expect difference. In this case, it's so interesting to find the differences or the attempts to differentiate because we, ex I, I mean, we expect the blurring and the sameness. So for me, there's overall, it's been, it was a really interesting approach and, and you really, Valerie does a really good job of kind of um, bringing to the fore all of the different, well, the strands or we could call them the frames um, that this Italian adventure project <laughs> in the Dodecanese and the Aegean can be seen. Um, and um, I guess I have questions, I mean, what came to mind a lot was, um, obviously we could see Italy alongside the great power colonial states in the context of the Eastern question, which it never comes into play really when we read about it in the Ottoman, you know, in the context of the Ottoman empire and the Eastern question, it's this kind of silent partner um, that then, springs into action in, what is it, 1919 or 1920, right? When they do even occupy the Southern, I'd love if you could tell us a little bit about that actually in the Q and A is like, what happened there? It was a couple years, right? The Italians were down in Antalya. Um, where does that fit into this whole, um, this whole story of the Dodecanese as an extension of it? Is it like just a separate episode? Um, so there's that. Um, and the Italian, the, the sort of, fantasy or the romanticization of um, the Italian medieval presence in Rhodes and the Crusaders that was to me that was so similar to the French in Lebanon and Syria right in the mandate period and um, I don't know if you like in Baalbek if you go there you can see the remnants still of that um, tourism that sort of attempt to develop tourism and to to really um, materialize that fantasy of, of this French connection um, in that area so it was in that sense it's I would think it's comparable to those kinds of projects. Um, if you want, I can go ahead and answer the first question about Antalya. Can I just ask one more? Because yes. I think it's all part of the same bundle. Okay. Um, it is so another concept that kept coming to mind because what was so interesting is like you're really bringing out this, you know which again is a dilemma in the case of French history as well, right? This empire, this France as, a, as you know, the nation par excellence and then French empire and how are they connected? Is one feeding the other? Are they two separate things? Um, and in Italy, it's just even more interesting in the Italian case. And, I, and the word that kept coming to mind thinking of the Greek case is irredentism. Um, so, because you're talking about how there is already an Italian community, Italian population, obviously, in the Levant, in the Dodecanese, in the Aegean. Um, they never use, it's never this concept, because in the Greek case, that's all you see is irredentism. The Greek attempt to expand, there's a split within the Greek state from the mid 19th century on of people who want a greater Greece, right, who want to just focus on expansion, and then the people who want to keep a small Greece and develop what they have, sort of thing, right? This also brings me to the question about the liberals versus the, I think you're calling them the extreme or radical nationalists turned fascists, right? And so to what extent is that split happening within Italy about what this project is and whether it should be happening at all? So in Greece, this irredentism thing, it's all about cloaking what is really a colonial aspiration as the expansion of this, the natural um, redemption of these populations, right, that are under Turkish rule. Of course, the concept of irredentism does not 
take into account at all how one is going to deal with the others in those territories once one gets those territories, right? So what the Turks, the Jews, like there's no place for them in an irredentist vision because it's all about redeeming the nation, right? So that's, it seems like Italy is actually a little bit ahead of the game there where they, they are, they have some space for um, governing some kind of cosmopolitan population, even though it has, the justification has somewhat to do with the fact that Italians are already there and with the historical presence, they're also allowing for the fact that others also inhabit that space and can continue to inhabit it. Inhabit it. So I just wondered, you know, what the potential is to exploring this kind of compare and contrast with the way mm. Greece. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna to jump in quickly just to yeah. say, thank you, Christine, my God, you just <laughs> raised up, you know, like a semester's worth of, <laughs> stuff because the analogies you know the cognates of irredentism and levantinism mm -hmm. and these are all very powerful mm -hmm. ideas that are in circulation and anyway i'm not taking over i'm actually <laughs> stepping in at this moment to say so this is the bad painful news is we don't have that much time left so valerie if you'll accept my my telling you what to do uh why don't you spend a few moments as quickly it's awful to ask you to be so brief in response to christine and then we actually have a few questions in the chat so i'll when we get to that then i'll just read them out loud so that everyone will hear what they are so you go um so to answer your first question about antalya um that absolutely is something which is linked to the Dodecanese because Italy is able to participate in the kind of Greco-Turkish war uh, precisely because it already has an army in, in the mm. Dodecanese. So they can sort of, dis they dispatch part of their navy from, um, from, from Rhodes and then they participate in this, this Greco-Turkish war. And of course, it's actually something which there's a little bit of research about, not enough. And what there is, it looks really bad for the Italians. It looks <laughs> like that they basically say that they're going to, you know, support the Greeks in their irredentist cause. But in fact, they, 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 you know, <laughs> they make kind of all kinds of secret agreements with the French and the British, and and they they really help the help along the Turkish become victorious in that <laughs> war. So it's um, it really speaks to the fact that for whatever reason this kind of chapter in the post World War One moment in Italy hasn't been included. So there's all kinds of discussions about how obviously D'Annunzio in Fiume is you know this is something that's the beginning of you yeah, know, beginning of, um, <laughs> which Dominique has written about very well <laughs> right but there's but it's interesting to place um you know there's a parallel moment of also going into to to Turkey at the same time so there's multiple attempts to kind of bring um bring you know the the territories which were promised to Italy for its participation in the World War I on the si side of the French and the British, the Dodecanese and uh, Asia Minor <laughs> is one of the is territories in these regions. Uh, sphere of influence in the East is what it feels that it's entitled to mm -hmm. because of its contribution to the war. I mean, it's interesting to think about the relationship to irredentism um, because it is kind of in this way, of course, thought about as one another, potentially another war of the unification. Um, with the unifications in 1860, but some of the, the some of the battle generals that lead this, you know, are the ones they fought in the wars of the unification, right? And this is going to be their last hurrah at the efforts to kind of grow the Italian nation state. Mm -hmm. um, and I think where the difference comes in between kind of the liberals and the idea of, of growing the Italian nation state to incorporate these Italian communities that are living in the Levant, of which there are many, and there's all kinds of, you know, they want to heavily rely on the idea of, um, you know, the Italian was the, is still the lingua franca because of the Venetian empire. People still use Italian mm -hmm. to communicate with one another. Yeah. And where there's that turn there with the kind of radical nationalists, which then become the fascists, is I, I, I think it's kind of 
well, what's happening at that time is, and there's also the beginning of these projects in spaces where they're going to have to deal with a lot more than just Italians living in those spaces, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to have to deal with uh, nomads, Berbers, Turks, um, and uh, Greek Orthodox who do not, you know, they, they kind of greet them as liberators, but then they are pretty far from Italians, right? Um, so I think that's, it contributes to that more, more right wing turn. And um, as for your point too about kind of comparing it with the, you know, with um, kind of French medievalism in Syria, I think that's a really interesting reminder of how one of my points here is not to say that, well, Italy was like, you know, all of these other imperial projects, but um, that Italy offers something for how we understand, you know, other European imperial projects in the Mediterranean, especially, but in general. So it's more like, what does Italy offer the study of European history, as opposed to trying to kind of say that it's, you know, like the French or British mm -hmm. Empire? Mm -hmm. Great. So um, thank you very much. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Valerie. <laughs> thank I'm you. going to now, so even though I think many of you can see the questions in the chat, but not everybody's looking at the chat. So Valerie, I'm going to go through the questions that are in the chat all at once, but slowly with very good diction. So you can then have the remainder of the time to address as much as possible. Does that work? Mm -hmm. Okay, Dominique writes, I'm fascinated about this idea of looking at on the ground experience of Italian empire. And I'm wondering if you see any efforts among locals to make Italian state makers on the day to day do things a la Ottomana, or to put it another way, instead of just talking meta geographies, do you see a pragmatic localism that corners the top from the bottom to behave similarly flipping thereby the cliche of stessa faccia into stessa cultura of government. Um, so that's number one. Brenda Rosado, hi Brenda, uh, says, I just have a comment. The questions that you raised with your work ought to be raised when it comes to the colonialism of the classics. It goes back to the myth or quote unquote legitimization of the Roman empire through Virgil's Aeneid, the so-called prophecy that justifies Romanization. There is an urgency to rethink how to teach the classics in relationship to what has continued to happen. And thank you so much for the event. Donna Di Giuseppe, hi Donna. Uh, do you think this ethereal Italian presence, to use Christine's word, in the Eastern Mediterranean stems from the ancient Roman architecture, for example, of Ephesus, or even the legend of Marco Polo as a connector, or the power allure of the ancient Romans? Thanks. Yes, the power allure is so true. Angelo Matteo, hello. Uh, very interesting talk. Could you please expand? So he's this is thinking archivally. I've got the I got the Angelo Matteo question here. Could you please expand on why the Dodecanese were controlled by the Foreign Office rather than the Ministry of the Colonies? Was it a matter of racial makeup, of challenges of settlement in the Dodecanese as opposed to Libya, or of strategic importance vis-a-vis -vis British Cyprus? And then Selena, hello, says Vanda, Vil Vanda Wilcox has a book coming out on Italian empire in World War I going up to 1923, which is really good to know and no question. And then Daphne Lapa says, my question is how far back in time, this is a mystery to me as well, does this idea of una faccia una razza between Italians and Greeks go? So if you're in Rhodes, you know, Greek, if you, if you ask, Greek people will say, oh, we always, una faccia una razza, but then the question is, when did this become such an instrumental expression. Uh, Daphne adds, I was always connecting it to World War II, but if I understand correctly, it predates it, question mark. And that's, those are the questions. Okay, thank you. I think I'll just go in order here. Um, so so um, it's really interesting question, how far you can take kind of this from below approach. Um, it's obviously a really challenging dimension to work in because if you're working with archival documents, it's very hard to kind of recuperate what were the what were the actors. And I mean, I also did, I was still able when, since I did this as my dissertation, I, I was still in the position a while ago to do some interviews. I don't think anyone is some oral histories. I don't think anyone has left at this point, but um, so I do, 
I, you know, and it's an interesting idea of, you know, could they kind of kind of press sort of the Ottoman onto um, Italian governance? And I think obviously there is kind of this way in which Italy has to adapt its state building to the kind of old Ottoman system. So to give some concrete examples of where this comes into play, you know, they have to legitimize legally things that they don't have in practice in Italy, like divorce, right? It's well known that divorce doesn't come until much later in, in, in Italy, but because kind of Greek Orthodox and, and um, you know, and Muslim, all of the religions there allow divorce, it has to kind of adapt and be able to, to work under these um, work under these conditions. So, so this, there's a lot of way in which um, I think that yes, governments is, governance is obviously adapting to, to what's happening there. And, and I think your question is a good one is to what degree is also, I think what you're asking is to what degree then is kind of some of these cliches and admission of the fact that their state policy you know, wasn't successful as they, you know, the state building, this empire, Roman empire building was a bit of a facade and that they were always trying to kind of, they always had to negotiate with on the ground realities. And I do try and write about in my book kind of give an everyday life approach. So what were the ways in which kind of the local population was also always sort of reinventing and working around the Italian states kind of attempts to change change their identity and change their systems, right? And I think that's a way actually in which we can kind of get at some of these positive memories of the Italian state because what's happening there is it's very similar to what happened in Italy, which is that people kind of remember their anti-fascism, their small acts of anti-fascism. And, and that kind of has turned into the le legend of what well, we were all anti-fascists, right? Because the fascist state was so, in, was so grandiose in its goals, right? It was obvious that we could find a way to kind of subvert those goals. So I think that's a really interesting way in which too, that we can think about kind of, this is a, as another case of that, part, that um, type of colonial memory or memory of fascism rather, but in this setting. So um, thank you for that question. I could go on and on about everyday life. Um, so, uh, so yes, and also I enjoy thinking about this problem of, I mean, obviously the Roman empire here, this kind of relates to Daphne's last question is how far does, back does this idea go? And I mean, it does seem that it's obviously part of Virgil's narrative, right? Um, and to what degree, you know, the Roman empire is obviously the inheritor of Greek culture when it founds the, when it kind of, when it, when it goes, founds the Roman Republic and then goes to being an empire. So I don't know if the expression one face, one phrase, race what was it existed in antiquity, but I certainly did find in relation to that, that, that it does predate World War II. You can, I did have oral informants that said, sure, I kind of remember people saying una faccia una razza, but we didn't take it seriously. We certainly didn't think about that in a very, we didn't take it lightly. We definitely didn't say that when we were talking about a member of our community marrying Italian, right? That there was still a lot of apprehension around kind of these, these relations and that the, the stereotype was something which I suppose worked in that dimension of trying to chip away at kind of the claims the rhetorical claims of the Italian, of, of the fascist state. Um, so I, I think that it's, it's uh, hard to say. I think that the other interesting part about that is obviously that expression has a new currency when you're talking about kind of the failure of, of nation states in the Mediterranean, right? If you, it's a good one to kind of pinpoint, well, you know, these, these nation states haven't been worked out the way that we hope they would, right? Um, it's better to think about kind of our shared cultural histories. So, so it's also a critique of the nation state. Um, and uh, so the question about, um, the question about why the dodecanese were controlled by the foreign office rather than the ministry of colonies um it seems to me obviously it is because they are a balkan space 
um, they can't be kind of constituted as, you know, terra nullis, um, they, um, which is kind of the groundwork for, for colonies. And they do, it is very delicate um, the way they end up with the Dodecanese after, after the Greco-Turkish War. They kind of, <clears throat> there's this moment where it looks like Rhodes is gonna be similar to Cyprus and then the rest of the islands are gonna go, go to Greece. And the way that they managed to achieve the annexation is by sort of holding hostage some other colonial spaces in East Africa, a border dispute with the British Empire in Somalia. And this sort of forces the British, off, um, for, uh, the British Foreign Office to capitulate to, to Mussolini's demands. Um, and so I, I'm, you know, it's obviously a diplomatic issue, right? They can't, they would incite diplomatic upheaval to call it, to kind of own up to the fact that what's going on is, is a colonization. But it's clear that that as then state actors start to sort of, then they have to sort of bring it up the dodecanese and say, well, what are we gonna do with these islands, <laughs> right? What are we gonna do? How are these gonna fit in with our big project, right? Um, and what are these, what's going on with this kind of possession in relationship to what we have in mind for the resettlement in Libya. So one of the things that I think about is that obviously resettlement is, I think Roberta Perger does a really good job. It's just saying that settlement doesn't happen because of Italy's population explosion, which is kind of a legend, but settlement also happens because Italy has to secure sovereignty in Lib Libya. Um, and I think in the Dodecanese, you can't really reasonably expect that you're going to have resettlement because of the kind of landscape, right? And so the way that you have to secure sovereignty is by kind of labeling them as Italian nationals. But your story, Christine, about how then no one really knows what this identity means is really revealing, right? Because it's kind of sure I'm an Italian national, sure I have Italian diplomatic protection or I have an Italian passport, but it can, you know, Italy is able, for example, to re revoke it very easily. So that I don't know, there's um, a scholar at University of Virginia, Chris Gratian, and he's looked at how all of these Ottoman deportations, all of these, when the, when the United States is trying to deport Greeks back to the Ottoman Empire, back to Greece, you know, then they, they show up with these Italian passports and Italy instantly reneges on any kind of claim to these people, right? <laughs> we don't want them, right? You know, <laughs> they can go back to Turkey. Um, so, so it is like a very, very, it is just there as a kind of placeholder, I think, or a kind of way to secure sovereignty and a way to imagine that the project is actually doing more than it is but then there's also a way in which it gets you know used by by a local population so one of the things too to think about that i thought was really interesting is that then now in the current context in which we have so many people acquiring italian citizenship through um you know lineage right their grandfather migrated from Naples and now they want to have Italian citizenship so they can go and live in Europe, right, and join the EU. <laughs> but that you actually do have an instance of some, some parts of the, you know, the community still using their Italian citizenship that was kind of just this placeholder in order to obtain Italian citizenship today. I'm yeah, I'm so sorry to do this, <laughs> but our, our time is up. I, some people have already been leaving. So also, I just want you to know that not everyone was able to catch um, oh, okay. all of that. But um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Valerie. I'm sorry to cut you off. I hate doing that. No, I, I thank you, Christine. Thank you. This thank was you. really a pleasure. Thank yeah. you, Christine. Yeah. For, uh, really appreciate that. Yeah, I love the book. Good job. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Nice to see you. Have a great Thank you.